Good evening and welcome to this week's session of People of Interest. We are deeply honored to have our guest of honor with us, Professor Kurtzer. Professor David Kurtzer is an anthropologist, a historian, and an academic leader specializing in the political and demographic history of Italy. He authored The Pope and Mussolini, which was the winner of the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for Biography and is the professor at Brown University. Professor Kurtzer's The Kidnapping of Edgardo Marturo was a finalist for the National Book Award in 1997, a fantastic book I would highly recommend among all of his books. And in 2016, Steven Spielberg announced that he would be making a film based on that particular book. Tonight's talk, titled The Pope, the Jews, and the Secret Archives, will address the long and complicated relationship between the Vatican and the Jews. The format for tonight will be a Q&A. So sit back, relax, and enjoy what promises to be a fascinating evening and discussion with Professor Kurtzer. Welcome, Professor. Nice to be with you. And thank you so much for taking the time. I know this is a hectic period, and uh, you have been inundated with requests to speak by Jewish communities and others around the U.S. and the world, uh, based on an incredibly popular recent article you wrote uh, in The Atlantic, which we'll get to uh, shortly in the next few minutes. But let me begin with a general question, Professor. Can you give us some background into the Vatican's attitude and efforts during World War II in relation to the fate of the Jews, and in particular, the deportation of the Jews of Rome in 1943? Yes, well, let's uh, start, try to give a little background. I've put together a few slides that I think might help uh, participants uh, understand a little bit better what uh, the history that I'd like to go through. So if we could, uh, if you could put up that first slide. Uh, here I just show as a kind of way of introduction, the uh, main uh, person at the center of what became, has become such a huge controversy, the controversy over the silence of the Pope during the Holocaust. And this is Pope Pius XII, uh, who becomes Pope in 1939, uh, next to him, because I want to put this in the context of what was going on in Italy at the time, and as you mentioned, the, uh, particularly how the Holocaust affected uh, Rome, the Jews of Rome. Uh, here you have a trip that Hitler, I'm sure uh, folks recognize at least two of these three characters, Hitler in the middle, uh, to Hitler's right is Mussolini, and the shorter fellow is King Victor Emmanuel III of Italy. Hitler makes a triumphal visit in, 19, in the spring of 1938 to Italy. Um, and at the time, there's a Pope Pius XI who will uh, die uh, several months later, but is actually not very pleased about Hitler for various reasons. Uh, the Jews are not the central ones, uh, although he's not happy about Hitler's uh, racism, which he regards as uh, pagan. Uh, from the Pope's point of view, the important thing is whether or not you're Catholic, not whether or not you're, you're uh, Aryan. In any case, we go to the next slide, um, just to give you an idea of the controversy. The controversy really broke out uh, in public with a play in 1963 by a German playwright you see in the middle there, Rolf Ra Hachuth. His play uh, represented the Pope as refusing to speak out as the Jews of Europe were being butchered. And the uh, church reacted quite strongly, uh, denying this, uh, defending the Pope. Um, then in uh, 1999, it uh, got renewed, the debates got renewed, the polemics became fiercer even with the book by the British uh, journalist John Cornwell's book, Hitler's Pope, with its provocative uh, title. Uh, but as I mentioned, there's been very strong uh, defense within the church of the Pope, who uh, by some of his defenders is even portrayed as one of the Jews' greatest uh, protectors in you know, world history. Here I give us an example, a film that was made, but there are many other examples that could be given. This is fairly recent Italian film, 2015, where if you can see, they portray the Pope, this is supposed to be Pius XII, wearing a Star of David and showing yeah. solidarity with the uh, Jews during the Holocaust, which of course never happened. One other thing, if we go to the next slide, this uh, relates to is not just the question of the silence of the Pope during the Holocaust, but what made the Holocaust possible in the first place? How was it that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of uh, people in Europe in the middle of the 20th century, thinking of themselves as Christians, could go about uh, murdering Jewish men, women, and children. 
And for that, um, centuries of Christian demonization of the Jews uh, has certainly, I think, played an important role. And I, I've written a couple of books, one called The Popes Against the Jews, and then this one, The Pope and Mussolini, um, which the rabbi mentioned, and which deals particularly with the 1920s and, and 30s, uh, to really get at what, what uh, happened. And uh, I think what we see, if we look in, uh, clear-eyed at this history, is that the Nazis and the fascists in Italy leaned heavily on Christian materials in trying to turn their populations against the Jews and regard, uh, to regard the Jews as their mortal enemies. If we look at the next slide, just to give a little bit of historical background here, uh, Mussolini comes to power in Italy in 1922. It's actually 11 years uh, before Hitler does. Hitler comes to power in, in January 33 in, in Germany. And in fact, Mussolini becomes the role model for Hitler as he's trying to come to power uh, throughout the 20s. Uh, and it was in 1929 that you see Mussolini there together with the Secretary of State of the Vatican, uh, Pietro Gaspari, signing a historic document, the Lateran Accords and the Concordat. This establishes Vatican City for the first time, uh, just a, a very little bit of uh, Italian history. Uh, Italy it was only formed in the uh, 19th century. Before that, Italy was, uh, the peninsula was a patchwork of different kingdoms and, and dukedoms and whatnot. And lying in the middle was the Papal States where the Pope was also the king, as he had been for a thousand years there. So the unification of Italy came only when the Italian army conquered Rome from the Pope in 1870. And at that time, the uh, Pope uh, excommunicated the uh, prime minister, excommunicated the king and said no good Catholic could uh, show loyalty toward Italy as a nation state. Uh, so it was after, from 1870 to 1929, uh, it took all this time until there was this rapprochement and it came about through a deal with the dictator, through Mussolini. So there were very close relations between the Vatican and the fascist regime, although that would later become uh, among the things denied. Uh, if we look at the next slide, then nine years later, 1938, the racial laws, the anti-Semitic campaign begins against the Jews in Italy. Of course, the famous Nuremberg laws came about three years earlier in, in Germany, 1935. Uh, this uh, shot is taken actually from an anti-Semitic publication that the Italian government put out and uh, shows what some of these laws are. So in 1938, all of a sudden, all Jewish children were thrown out of school. All uh, Jewish teachers and professors were thrown out of their job. All Jewish uh, civil servants, the members of the military, uh, people who work for Jews who work for banks, for other companies, they're all thrown out of work. Uh, and the Vatican does not complain, in fact, uh, the fascist state uses Christian materials to justify its campaign, saying that as long as the popes had power in Rome, which they did until the previous century, they had confined the Jews to the ghetto and protected um, healthy Christian society from the depredations, the alleged depredations of the Jews. The one thing that the uh, church and the Vatican and the Pope did protest was insofar as the anti Semitic laws affected people the church regarded as Catholic, namely, baptized Jews. Uh, from the church point of view, the Pope would kept insisting uh, baptized Jews were not Jews, they should not be treated as Jews, they should be uh, not subject to the racial laws. If we look at the uh, next slide then, this was 1938, the racial laws come in. Uh, in uh, February of, of 1939, the Pope Pius XI dies. Uh, as I mentioned in his last months, he really turned against, particularly against Hitler and, and especially angry at Mussolini, who had previously had allied with, really. Um, but he was angry with Mussolini's increasing embrace of Hitler. Uh, we often think of uh, the relationship between the Vatican and these two totalitarian states, the two states of the Axis, Germany and, and fascist Italy, uh, in the same light. But from the Vatican point of view, from the Pope's point of view, they're totally different. Uh, Italy had, and fascist Italy had, carved out a special influential position for the uh, church. Uh, whereas from the, um, from the Pope's point of view and the Vatican's point of view, uh, the Nazis and Hitler was undermining the influence of the church in Germany. So Pius XI, who was the Pope in the 20s and 30s, was not happy about Mussolini embracing Hitler. Uh, but then he dies 
And uh, in fact, his death, there was some speculation that it may have been hastened by Mussolini, but that's a bit of a, another story. Um, and then if uh, we uh, look, look at the next slide, get some idea of the relationship going on, uh, this fellow, uh, Cesare Orsenigo, was the uh, nuncio, essentially the ambassador from the uh, Pope to the uh, Nazi regime. He had been for, uh, uh, since the beginning of the Nazi regime in 33. And he was basically a fan of Hitler. Uh, and um, I've been reading the reports he was writing from Berlin throughout the uh, 30s and, and in fact through the war years uh, to, to the Vatican. And he was constantly basically making excuses for the Nazis. Um, if we go to the next slide, the, um, it would be, so the war begins in, in 39 with the invasion September 1st, 39 uh, by the Germans of Poland. Initially, Italy doesn't get involved. The Pope, now Pius XII, uh, who we'll now be focusing on, um, is certainly not eager for Italy to join the war and, and does what he can to try to persuade uh, Mussolini behind the scenes without ever complaining publicly, but behind the scenes urge him to keep Italy out of the war. But on June 10th, 1940, as um, the German troops were just sweeping through France, he joins the war. Uh, so now uh, the Pope and the Vatican find itself in the middle uh, of a capital of one of the Axis powers at war. Now, as we, if we look at the next slide, uh, all this history basically came to be denied by the Vatican, but, not, but I think it's important to put this in a somewhat broader framework. It's denied by Italy as well, as we'll get to uh, those of us who uh, spend time, and I've spent many years living in Italy, uh, you get the impression there that Italy fought on the side of the Allies during the war and not on the side of the uh, of Hitler. But turning first to the Vatican here, um, I should say all this leading up to what's uh, the big news item about this year, about 2020, which is finally, after years of pressure, the Vatican has opened the archives for World War II, the archives for the papacy of Pius XII. Um, and I got to be one of the first people there, and along with my uh, collaborator, who luckily is uh, still there while COVID prevents me from uh, going back, uh, where I'm getting to read thousands of pages of newly available material from those archives that have just been open in March of this year. Uh, but in the month before they were open, just to give you an idea of these apologetics and this uh, denial of history, the Italian papers, and this is not a church paper, this actually is a paper identified with the kind of center left in Italy, La Repubblica, uh, but a number of the major uh, papers in Italy began publishing these articles uh, about the how the Pope was this great foe of fascism, the great foe of uh, Hitler, a uh, great friend of the Jews and so forth. And so this is a full page, uh, story you see from January of this year, just before the archives open, uh, the headline reads, so you see the translation there, thus Mussolini tried to stop Pope Pacelli. And it tells that when Pius XI died in February of 1939, that uh, Mussolini and the fascists worked behind the scenes to do whatever they could to prevent Pacelli from coming to power because he was such an anti-fascist. And it's the opposite of the truth. In fact, we know from the diplomatic correspondence of both the uh, Italian ambassador to the Holy See and the German, the Nazi ambassador to the Holy See, that they were working behind the, the scenes actively to promote the candidacy of Pacelli to become Pope. Uh, but as I mentioned, it's part of a larger denial of history that one finds in Italy, not just the Vatican. If you look at the next slide, give an example of it. Uh, so also this year in April, uh, the major newspaper in Italy, Corriere della Sera, uh, came out with a book series. It's one of these uh, cheap uh, versions of books. It was a series of a number of uh, histories of fascism, one of which was my Pope Mussolini book, the Italian edition. And initially, you see on the left, the ad they had for it, which caused such trouble that they had to replace it with a new ad. So the ad uh, if you look at the ad on the left for this book series about the history of fascism in Italy, it has a picture of Mus smiling Mussolini and the adoring uh, crowd listening to him. And it's uh, the title in English would be The Two Decades That Changed Italy. 
Well, this created an up uproar because it indicated that uh, Mussolini was popular and not just that, but that he somehow changed Italy when the um, approved a kind of politically correct uh, view of this history in Italy is that it was a historical parenthesis that very few people were enthusiastic about the fascist regime. So they had to change the ad and you see the new ad on the right there, they changed it to the two decades that convulsed Italy and you have Mussolini looking kind of grim and unhappy and absolutely nobody there to uh, salute him. Um, mm. If we then go to uh, the next uh, page. So as I mentioned, March 2nd, 2020, after decades where among others, the uh, Jewish community has been insisting on the opening of the archives to see what uh, actually, what role the Vatican in general and the Pope in particular played during the Holocaust. Um, on March 2nd, it was open. This is a picture of me uh, standing there next to me is Professor Hubert Wolf, who's a, one of the uh, most renowned uh, historians of this of church uh, Jewish relations and the uh, church relations with the Nazi regime. Uh, he had brought with him that whole collection of people are all uh, Germans who work in his uh, academic unit. And we're waiting there outside, inside the bowels of the Vatican, outside the door. That door you see is the door to the, what well, had been called the Vatican Secret Archives for uh, some hundreds of years until Pope Francis recently renamed it. Apparently the Secret Archives had a connotation he didn't like, and now it's called the Vatican Apostolic Archive. Um, and you see, uh, the larger um, courtyard in which that archive is found, uh, pictured on the left. The next slide, if we can go to, uh, yep, just to give people an idea. There's actually more than one archive that got open. There are various archives at the Vatican. And um, for those uh, of people who may have uh, seen the Vatican, uh, you see St. Peter's uh, Square there in the Bernini Colonnade. There's a separate door uh, where the Santana's Gate that one goes in and you go into an internal courtyard that we just saw pictured in the previous picture. And that's where the uh, two of the major Vatican archives are, the Vatican Apostolic Archive and the Secretary of State Archive. And a third archive that's also important uh, if one's interested in Vatican Jewish relations is the Archives of the Inquisition. And I've shown that that's actually around the other side of the uh, Vatican. And it's another place where I've been uh, working well, the, um, uh, sometimes I've been asked how I got interested in this history, and I hope I'm not going on too long, but just very briefly, and I'll end with this on this note. Um, I actually have some personal history, you could say, at least through my father, because uh, my father, if we look at the next uh, slide, was uh, the Jewish chaplain with the Allied troops that landed at Anzio. Um, so in, uh, 40, 1943, uh, Italy, uh, in July, uh, the king deposed Mussolini, and a month later, the uh, German army uh, came down and essentially occupied all it could of Italy, except for the very far south where Allied troops from North Africa had already made their way. Uh, but they occupied Rome and would stay in Rome for nine months. Uh, with the troops bottled up on the, uh, uh, in the mountains uh, south of uh, Rome, there was a new allied landing at the Anzio beachhead, which is 50 or so kilometers uh, south of Rome. And my father was, was a rabbi and was the uh, Jewish chaplain with the American army, and he was the only Jewish chaplain there. Uh, this Curiously, is a shot of him holding a, a service connected with Passover uh, in early April of 1944 in a wine cellar because uh, Anzio was actually under German constant bombardment from the mountains over it, overlooking it in, in April 1944. Uh, but finally, in the beginning of June of uh, 1944, the troops from Anzio, other Allied troops, would break through liberate Rome, and the Jews in Rome, who for nine months had been in hiding, those who hadn't been picked up and sent to their death at Auschwitz, uh, and there were about 2,000 who were uh, murdered uh, largely at Auschwitz in concentration camps who had been uh, picked up, thanks in good part to Italian informants by uh, Gestapo and German SS. Um, 
So the next slide is a kind of a happier scene because a few nights after, it was a Sunday, I think, that Rome was liberated, uh, that uh, Arab Shabbat, so that Friday evening, the, um, they opened up the Grand Temple of Rome, which of course had been closed for the nine months of German occupation. And uh, my father, Cole, as the representing the uh, Allied forces, um, uh, rabbi representing the Allied forces, co-led the service with the chief rabbi of Rome. Uh, right before it, before the service, a young GI, because in addition to, so you can imagine how dramatic a scene it was. The Jews who'd been in hiding uh, came out, they there looking around to see who had survived of their relatives, of uh, their friends, their fellow Jews of Rome. Um, but there were also a couple of hundred Jewish GIs there as well. And one of them, a young man, came up to my father right before the service and said um, he had, in fact, been from, he was from the Jewish community in Rome, but when the racial laws came in in 1938, his family had sent him to the U.S., perhaps to relatives. He had subsequently, as he grew up, uh, joined the U.S. Army. He was with the forces that had liberated Rome. That's why he was there. But he was desperate to know whether his mother had survived the war because he hadn't heard from her. And um, given, of course, what had happened and the chaos. So he asked, could my father make an announcement? And my father said, well, it'd be awkward for him to make an announcement because there were just so many cases like this. And he felt also the chief rabbi of Rome was really the one in charge. But he said, why don't you stand next to me when the, uh, the Shabbos service begins? And I'm sure if your mother is in the, uh, in the synagogue, she will recognize you. And sure enough, uh, as he stands next to my father, as the service is about to begin, there's a shout from the, uh, from the synagogue. And this woman, the mother, um, rushes up and somehow an artist captured this scene. It's actually quite a good uh, likeness of my father in the background there. And uh, this was uh, printed in various Jewish papers through, uh, through North America anyway. Uh, so this is a bit of uh, just the uh, personal history, which perhaps uh, at least partly explains how I became interested in this. Wow, what a beautiful um, overview. And uh, that personal touch at the end was deeply moving. So, Professor, you clearly chose to not go in the family business, line of business, <laughs> but, uh, you picked, <laughs> but you picked up on your father's story, and that is so moving. And a particular story uh, is really powerful, how your father was able to facilitate in that subtle way uh, the reunion of mother and son. Really, truly powerful. I want to pick up on some of the things you said because you said so many interesting things in just a few short minutes. First of all, I was uh, taken aback by the, the very real link you have made between the church and the Nazis. That is to say that the Nazis were inspired by the behavior of the church towards Jews, be it the ghetto or otherwise. And I found that very interesting. Is that link something that's universally accepted or is that contested? No, it's, uh, first of all, it's not at all universally accepted and of course rejected by the church and the Vatican. Uh, I would just I would put matters though a little bit differently than you did. I wasn't, wouldn't uh, necessarily claim that the uh, Nazis or Hitler was inspired by the church directly, uh, but certainly they uh, made great use of the history uh -huh. of church oppression of the Jews to justify what they were doing. They realized, well, certainly in Italy, where 99% you know, of the population was Roman Catholic, but even uh, in Nazi Germany, once, especially once they had uh, taken over Austria and the Sudetenland, about half of uh, the members of the Third Reich were Catholic, Roman Catholic. And so if you wanted to uh, you know, hit a responsive chord in demonizing the Jews, uh, you know, what would you do? Well, what you did is talk about uh, how various popes saw the Jews as as the enemy and dangerous and how various church councils had uh, denounced the Jews. Uh, and you could quote from uh, Vatican-related newspapers, for example, Civiltà Cattolica, which still today is the uh, Roman Jesuit publication overseen by the Vatican, whose pages have to be approved in advance before anything could be published. Uh, was filled with uh, demonization of the Jews. 
uh, including uh, for the racial laws that, uh, for instance, when Hungary uh, introduced in 1938 its own version of the anti-Semitic laws, Civiltà Cattolica, its pages approved by the Vatican in advance, uh, basically said how important this was that uh, states realized the dangers that Jews posed and the need to uh, take measures against them. So that, of course, uh, while the church and popes and church councils had never called for murdering the Jews, um, the notion that Jews were enemies, uh, were uh, dangerous, uh, that something had to be done about them, uh, this was very much uh, part of a very long uh, church tradition, which went right up to the beginning and into the Yes, thank you for actually, of course, refining that much more. Uh, I, I didn't mean the direct inspiration, but it does seem, if I understand correctly, that the th the, 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 the thousand year or plus uh, persecution uh, or attitudes of demonization towards the Jews may really, in a certain sense, made fertile, made the ground fertile for this to occur, without which it would have been much more challenging or difficult to sway an entire population. Um, yeah. You know, there's something I came, there was someone who came to see me some years ago, and he was right, he was creating a documentary about concentration camps in Italy. I think he, he said he had discovered that there were 10 or 11, something like that. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but I found that very interesting that there were actually concentration camps within Italy. There are actually two phases of concentration camps in Italy, which, you know, as you mentioned, aren't terribly well known. Um, the, in the early uh, years of the war, there were concentration camps set up uh, primarily for foreign Jews, that it, because uh, many German Jews, other Jews from Poland, elsewhere, uh, fleeing persecution, uh, came into Italy. And uh, one of the first uh, racial laws in uh, August of 1938 uh, specified that any foreign Jews uh, would be ejected from the country and that meanwhile they'd be put into concentration camps before they could figure out you know, how to get, get rid of them. Uh, but then in 1943, after uh, the Germans occupied Italy and Mussolini was set up as head of this public, uh, puppet uh, Nazi regime in the north of Italy, the, uh, what was called the Re uh, Republic of, uh, uh, of Italy, um, now, because the king was not in favor, it, so it became a republic uh, re called the uh, Social Republic of Italy, uh, announced its new policy. Its new policy that it announced was that all Jews should be immediately arrested, all their belongings should be seized, and they should be placed in concentration camps, which needed to be set up throughout the north of the uh, peninsula, which is the area that the uh, the fascists and the Germans controlled. So uh, there was a whole network of concentration camps set up for Jews in Italy. Wow. I'm wondering about what prompted the opening of the archives. Furthermore, let me ask, did you have access to all of those archives or just that which related to World War II? Uh, in particular, I'm interested to know whether if you did have greater access, you were able to go as far back as the the destruction of the temple period. I know there's a lot of curiosity around that. You did mention the Inquisition. Uh, just curious to know what prompted it and what what are some of the most surprising and maybe shocking findings that you made? Uh, and, 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 and what more is there to come? Well, um, there's a lot more I think to come because they just opened the archive, these archives in um, a few months ago and not just that, but then they, at the moment, for example, they're closed because of uh, COVID. Uh, they were closed a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we were hoping they'd get open pretty soon. But you know, as we all know, <laughs> this is all uh, a matter for speculation. Uh, you have to realize how how things work at the Vatican. It um, you know, whereas other kinds of archives may have you know fifty year rule after fifty years, uh, people uh, papers become available and so on. The Vatican, it's up to the current Pope to decide when to open the next materials that have yet to be open, and it goes not by years but by papacy. Mm. So you open, so in answer to your question, is it just the warriors? No, because it's for the whole papacy of Pius XII. That's the way it works. And he was pope from 1939 till uh, 1958. So uh, in fact, some of the more interesting material, including that Atlantic article I wrote in August that you mentioned about the finale uh, fair in France and the, uh, the forced baptism case of the two Jewish boys there and their kidnapping, um, 
that would, deals with period right after the war and all that material I just found because it just became available. You know, if you're talking about earlier periods, theoretically that has been available uh, for, you know, for years, depending how far back uh, one goes. Uh, in terms of you know surprising findings, well, for well, for instance, for my book, the Pope of Mussolini that we mentioned earlier, uh, dealing with the 1930s, I discovered when they opened those archives, which were opened about uh, now about 15 years ago, I guess, uh, I found a document which uh, showed that just before Mussolini was about to unveil the first racial laws, he reached a agreement behind the scenes never previously revealed till my book, um, with, uh, with the Pope to buy the Pope's silence with the anti-Semitic campaign and in exchange for uh, various benefits for the church. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that was pretty surprising document, uh, dramatic document to find. In terms of uh, the, the most recently opened archives, I would just mention one that, that I actually put in the appendix or a couple of documents I put uh, the transcription or translation in the appendix of that article, uh, which was right after the roundup of the Jews, uh, the initial roundup of the Jews of Rome, which was uh, famously October 16th, 1943 by the Nazis. So I mean, let's you know, just to get to the scene. Um, it, the SS tries to find all the Jews they possibly can in Rome, both in the ghetto and other parts of the city and spend hours hurting uh, frightened Jewish uh, Jews, actually mainly uh, women and children, because the Jewish community at that time was under the mistaken impression that just uh, men were going to be in trouble with the Nazis. Only the men would be rounded up, so many of the men had fled. So they were rounded up over a thousand Jews uh, and put them in a holding area, literally just outside the walls of the Vatican and kept them there for two days before they would be put on a train and sent to their death at Auschwitz. Well, the uh, Pope was under great pressure to speak out, and he didn't. He didn't want to antagonize the Germans for various reasons we could talk about. Um, and But one of the documents there that I found uh, and I published in that Atlantic piece that seemed to make quite an uproar, including leading to a full page denunciation in the pages of the Vatican Daily Newspaper uh, a week later, uh, showed that one of the advisors of the Pope suggested that he at least privately speak out about the ongoing roundup of Jews, even beyond the thousand, another thousand Roman Jews would be rounded up over the next months and murdered and even more further north in, in Italy. Um, and I found uh, both that document uh, urging the Pope to speak out and a, the uh, document that the Monsignor, who was who the Pope regarded as his main expert on Jewish matters, uh, advised him against speaking out, even privately. This was not to speak out publicly. And they were both actually filled with the most anti-Semitic kind of language you can imagine. Uh, the person who wrote that, um, you know, even more anti-Semitic kind of uh, uh, advice and including not to speak out in any way against the, uh, the ongoing murder of Italy's Jews uh, would later become the Cardinal Vicar of Rome. So the church apparently, the Vatican was not terribly happy with my article and as I mentioned, uh, slid to uh, the next week, the full page being devoted in Los Retoi Romano, the, the Vatican's daily newspaper, um, trying to uh, wow. somehow undermine it. But, but uh, you know, here's something that I wonder about. How could they, how could they put out any type of, you know, renunciation or rebuttal to, to a clear document that comes from their archives? That's question one. Question two is, is actually what goes on behind the scenes before an archive is opened? I mean, clearly the current Pope knows what's there. I cannot mm -hmm. imagine he wasn't informed what type of explosive information would come to for really laying to rest, uh, I think unequivocally, once and for all, this, this, this supposed controversy and establishing it as a fact that Pope, 12, uh, Pope Pius XII was complicit and did not, you know, not just publicly, but privately as you spelled out. What would go into his decision to allow it? Is it public pressure or is there some actual behind the scenes do you think maybe as an 
is an individual, he, he wants the story to be told. Or mm -hmm. there are powers that be that say it's time to acknowledge this fact. Or is it politics? Is it completely, does he have veto power? Is it down to the Pope or is he, is there a group? How does it work? It seems to me like it's it's complex. And, and in a sense, the fact that they opened it up, knowing full well what would come from it, is in a certain sense a recognition that we're ready to start to deal with the demons of the past. Yeah, so those are good questions. The, um, you know, how do they deny it when you know, I, I published their own document from their own archive? Exactly. Of course, they can't deny the existence. Well, I don't know if I, if I mentioned this. In 1998, because of all this uh, commotion about the uh, concern about the role of the Vatican with respect to the Holocaust, uh, the after 11 years of study, a Vatican body held, uh, headed by a cardinal with the preface of the report written by the Pope John Paul II uh, came out with a statement called We Remember. And it claimed that the Vatican and the church had absolutely nothing to do with the kind of demonization of the Jews that led to the Holocaust. It made a distinction between what it called uh, anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism and said, well, unfortunately, some sons and daughters of the church, not popes and cardinals and so on, uh, had in the past been guilty of anti-Judaism, but that was simply based on religious negative ideas and had nothing to do with the Holocaust. Whereas anti-Semitism, uh, which began in the late 19th century, uh, focused on uh, social, political, economic, racial kinds of questions, and that's what led to the Holocaust. And that's why I wrote the book, The, the Popes Against the Jews, to show that, that it has absolutely no basis in history, that in fact, there is no such situation. Um, and when that book came out, Chilota Catholica, the Vatican overseen Jesuit journal I mentioned earlier, uh, and a lead story of 20 pages attacking my book. So it began to teach me how this is dealt with. They kind of answer your question in this roundabout way. And basically the two main um, uh, approaches, because you can't deny the actual evidence that I was citing, which was from their own archives, from the pages of their own journal, their uh, horrendously anti-Semitic article after article after article. That was, by the way, constantly being cited by the fascist regime to justify its anti-Semitic campaign. Uh, so being unable to actually deny all that, they uh, two things. They engage in ad hominem attack. The Jewish historian David Kurtzer says and this kind of thing, and changing the subject, saying he you know, didn't say anything about how the fact that Rabbi so and so in 1946 said what a wonderful savior of Jews the Pope was, and you know, this kind of thing. So this is and this is similar to what appeared in the Vatican newspaper um, just a couple of months ago in reaction to my Atlantic piece, which I think was the first significant report of findings from the newly opened archives. In terms of, um, you know, didn't they realize when they opened the archives that this would come out? And that too is an interesting question. Um, the, and I don't entirely know how to respond to it. Of course, the uh, authorities did resist opening these archives for, you know, there have been these demands for the Jewish community, including from Jewish organizations for decades to have these, particularly for the war, a wartime period opened and they hadn't been. And so perhaps you know, one explanation is they weren't that eager for these documents to be seen. But it was Pope Francis who finally uh, authorized the opening. And although he has himself, on what little he said about Pius XII, tended to defend him, um, he's also called for greater transparency in the church. And... Um, coming to terms with unfortunate, uh, uncomfortable features of the church's history. And it's true that church organizations in uh, most recently in Germany, but also France and elsewhere, have come to terms with, uh, at least to some extent, with the responsibility of the national churches in failing to protest the, the Holocaust while it was, it was happening, but the Vatican has not. David, it sounds to me like you are, uh, if not public enemy number one, way up there. Uh, to these more, if you will, whitewashing elements within the Vatican, because you have literally dedicated a few books to shining a very important light on this darker side of of the Vatican history, which is an important story that to be told. 
It's complicitly, it's silenced by a religious body with tremendous influence, by individuals who are meant to represent the highest morals. The fact that this roundup took place and it was literally outside the walls of the Vatican is gut-wrenching and is, is a stain on, 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 on the Pope, on the Pope's legacy. And, and, and I think it's, the, the, this needs to be, it needs to gain much wider audience. And I think the fact that you're seeing that type of backlash is itself testament to the importance of the work that you do. So first of all, tremendous kol hakavod, as we say, uh, for, for going out there and, and you know, putting yourself out there to tell this story. Um, a, a few quick questions. First of all, you know, maybe this isn't something we want to get into in depth, but you said there were rabbis who came out defending what would have been their motivation? And more particularly, what's the Italian Jewish community's view on Pope you know, Pius XII and, and, and specifically exposing this story? Are they uncomfortable? You know, if it's something that the man on the street is really deeply uncomfortable with, as in the Italian wider Gentile population, do, is the Jewish community's take on all this, let's keep under the radar? Or yeah. are they reaching out to you to encourage you to go out there and tell this story? Are they afraid of repercussions? What is the, what's the Jewish Italian view on all of this? Well, this has changed actually over, over the years. Um, as you kind of touched upon, right after the war, I think uh, it wasn't just the Christians, uh, Catholic majority in Italy who wanted to uh, bury this history and in fact reinvent a history that never occurred in which it wasn't the Italians had nothing to do with the Holocaust. It was all, you know, the Germans' fault and so forth. Uh, and it was in the interest, it seemed to be at least psychologically, um, a number of historians have said recently, in the interest of the Jews of Italy to try to go along with that narrative, that in fact, uh, they were welcome in, in Italy, their Catholic neighbors always looked kindly upon them and would never have uh, gone along with their persecution. Uh, but in more recent years, I think uh, people are thinking, uh, no, we need to really come to terms and understand what, what happened. And certainly the current uh, chief rabbi of Rome, uh, Riccardo Di Segni, whom I've gotten to know a bit, uh, has certainly been very much encouraging me. In fact, when they were about to open the archives uh, March 2nd, he asked me to come to his office at the, the synagogue, uh, which I did uh, the day before the, of the opening, so I guess March 1st. And we spent an hour talking, and, and he certainly was very encouraging uh, of, my, of my work and the importance of, of doing it. So uh, that's certainly uh, gratifying uh, for me as well. Wow. I d have you at any point felt uh, threatened? Did you ever feel unsafe doing this work? It's a personal question. I, I don't know. Maybe it's yeah. a dramatic question, but I'm curious. Yes, well, I guess don't publish my address here. Um, <laughs> I mean, serious. I sometimes get asked that question. No, really, I haven't felt felt that. I mean, it's unpleasant. You know, I'm an academic, and academics, you know, we're used to getting involved in arguments with other academics, but it's all uh, kept at a certain kind of uh, abstract level and doesn't become personal. So, uh, you know, some of this kind of material, and, uh, you know, I'm talking about Vatican related publications, that's one thing. But in fact, for the right wing of the church, uh, Pius XII is a great hero, and anything which has seemed to uh, undermine that heroic image is seen as greatly threatening. So if you go on um, you know, the web, you can certainly find some pretty vicious attacks on me uh, from those quarters. So, uh, and you know, why is Pius XII a great hero of the right wing of the church? Because uh, the Jews have a lot to do with it, because it was with uh, his successor, John XXIII, who convened the Second Vatican Council, that the centuries-long demonization of the Jews by the church was brought to an end. And uh, that was a major part of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, and it was the Second Vatican Council that, from the right-wing point of view of the church, is where the church went wrong. And in fact, if mm. you go uh, on Twitter, for those of, for viewing, I don't know whether anyone follows Twitter, but probably similar uh, social media as well, and you put Pius the Twelfth in any day, you'll find various people saying that was the real, the last Pope after Pius XII, there hasn't been a legitimate Pope. And they're, you know, cool for the Jews of the Masons or whatever. Uh, so there's some pretty vicious stuff out there. 
Wow. I want to jump to, and then come back to this maybe in a little bit. I want to jump to what I find, what I found one of the most fascinating and gripping books, the book you wrote about Edward uh, Edgar Martaro, that a Jewish child who was secretly baptized by his nanny, unbeknownst to his parents. And the child was subsequently kidnapped by the church, claiming that once baptized, according to church doctrine, regardless of the circumstances of that baptism, the child belongs to Christianity. Uh, of course, it's an incredible read, highly, highly recommended. It tells a very important chapter in the history of Jewish Vatican relations, which had huge ramifications, including, as you mentioned, the you know unification of Italy, which I imagine is why Steven Spielberg, who is a, who's obviously the great uh, director, has taken an interest in this, because it's a story where it seems like one relatively local or minor event has national and really global um, ramifications. And a more recent example of this controversial doctrine came to head after the war, you mentioned it briefly earlier, when two Jewish children, Robert and Gerald Finale, were held by the church on similar grounds. Can you share a brief overview of that story and the involvement of Pope Pius uh, XII? Yes, in fact, my uh, the Atlantic article that uh, was mentioned that came out in August, but I think it's freely available for anybody who's interested on, online. Um, uh, report some of the, as I mentioned, the first findings really from these newly opened archives that have to do with the immediate post-war period. So, uh, but as uh, you suggest, Rabbi, this is part of a century, many centuries long practice of the church that where uh, Jewish children were baptized, even against the knowledge and will uh, of their parents, they were regarded as Catholic and therefore could not be raised by Jews, so had to be seized from the Jewish parents and raised in Catholic institutions. Uh, this was the case of Edgardo Mortara in Bologna in 1858, when Bologna was still part of the Papal States, and so the Pope had police powers as well, uh, which allowed him uh, to take the uh, children and keep them, uh, keep uh, this child, Edgardo, from his parents. Uh, but the post-war case is one of a larger phenomenon that the Jewish community was very concerned about uh, in the, at the end of the war, um, because there were th many thousands of Jewish orphans of the Holocaust whose parents had been uh, carted off to concentration camps and murdered, but one way or another, the children had been uh, spared, hiding out in various places, including various Catholic institutions, which fortunately uh, took them in to save them. But in some of these cases, these children were uh, baptized, and in, if they were baptized from the church point of view still then, uh, they should not be returned to their Jewish and so uh, this was the case as you mentioned of the uh, Finale uh, boys. Uh, the case very briefly was this. The uh, parents who were Jews living in Grenoble in, in southeastern uh, France, who in uh, early 1944 were uh, picked up by the Gestapo, taken to Auschwitz where they were murdered. Uh, the children ended up with a Catholic uh, woman locally who um, kept them hidden for the uh, last few months of the uh, before liberation by the Allies in France, even before the war ended, but after France had been liberated. So February 45, uh, the s surviving sisters of their father um, got in touch with this woman, thanked her for protecting uh, their two young uh, children. They were, they were born in 41, 42, so they were you know, one and two or so when uh, when their parents were taken away to the concentration camp, they had been circumcised. Their parents uh, were practicing Jews and were eager for their children, despite what was going on in, in France and Europe at the time, to uh, be proud of their Jewish identity. Um, well, the woman refuses to uh, give the children back to the parents, to the, excuse me, to the relatives, to the aunts. And um, she you know, has various kind of anti-Semitic things to say. Uh, and over the next few years, I won't go into the details because it, it takes a while, uh, but sh as the courts began a series of orders that she should return these children to their family, uh, she refuses. And with the support of a kind of underground network of nuns and monks, uh, spirits them from one monastery and convent to another. Eventually, in the beginning of 1953, when this really becomes a huge scandal in France, leads to hundreds and hundreds of newspaper articles, um, the uh, a group of monks uh, 
spirit them across the Spanish border to a monastery in Basque land, Spanish Basque land. Uh, so what I discovered in these newly opened archives this year was a long correspondence between uh, the leader of the church, leaders of the church in France, particularly the Cardinal uh, Archbishop of Lyon uh, and the uh, Pope and the men around the Pope and the Secretary of State, but also documentation in the uh, Holy Office, formerly the Holy Office of the Inquisition, about what to do, should these children be returned to their Jewish family or not. And what I discovered is uh, that uh, although what was going on in France was pretty well known, it was not known until my discoveries in the Vatican archives that just were open this year, uh, that the Pope was basically directing the uh, people in the church in France to not return the children to the Jewish relatives, if at all possible, to keep them from them, thus continuing the church doctrine, church policy that had been around for centuries and that had, in fact, uh, explained the case of Edgardo Mortara back in the 19th century. If you uh, could put up, I think I did provide a, a view. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, if that last slide that I had could be put up, um, so finally, they because they, they've um, the the French authorities have jailed the woman who originally took the boys plus a whole number of monks and nuns, uh, charging them with kidnapping. Uh, the uh, two boys now ten and twelve years old are brought back, and the uh, sister of their father, so this is their father's sister uh, that you see there, is Israeli. So she has gone. She went in the thirties to escape the persecution in, um, in Vienna, she had gone to, to uh, Palestine. And uh, it's now, of course, we're in 1953, so it's Israel. And uh, she is there, uh, this is showing her when she first gets to meet her uh, two nephews. And later that month, uh, this is July, 1953, much to the anger of the Pope, uh, as I discovered in the uh, newly opened archives, she puts them or takes them on a flight back to her home in Israel where they would be raised and where they're to be found now uh, no longer quite so young in Israel. Wow, I mean, it's it's absolutely shocking. This stuff just doesn't end. You know, mm -hmm. there's World War II. You could say he had political considerations, which I'm, we, we don't even, I don't know what, what their official defense is for Pope, you know, Pius XII, but this is, this is, this is really outlandish. And my question to you is, has the Vatican, ha, have efforts been made to reform uh, such doctrines? Uh, you know, I, this is something I've been wondering about. These doctrines no. are at the heart of this historical animosity and really persecution of, of individual kids from families, which is brutal by any standard. Have efforts been made to eradicate or root this particular doctrine among other doctrines that have been at the heart of mm -hmm. this uh, a historical anti-Semitism coming from the church? Well, I'm um, first in the broader context, um, very importantly, in part of really coming out of the Second Vatican Council in 1965, uh, the Vatican declaration was released, uh, Nostra Aetate, which ended the doctrine that Jews were collectively responsible mm -hmm. for the murder of Jesus and so on, the deicide. Uh, and that the Jews were therefore condemned by God to you know, wander the earth as a uh, condemned people uh, for all eternity until they you know, saw the light and uh, became Christian. So this was very important, very important change in church policy toward the church. The specific doctrine, mm. curiously, about baptism, uh, baptizing Jewish children against the will of their parents, uh, hasn't changed. I, I was kind of amazed by this myself. And in fact, I, in the Atlantic piece, have a link to the uh, official Vatican canon law page today, which uh, suggests wow. that if you've, uh, uh, a Christian, a Catholic, see uh, a, Jew, a Jewish child or a child, a non Christian child uh, in danger of death, it, was, it would be a good thing, even against the um, advice of the parents or the, the uh, knowledge of the parents to baptize uh, that child or those children. The difference, of course, is they don't, the church uh, doesn't have the police power it did in the papal states in the case of Edgardo right. Mortara. Uh, so it may be that these kind of cases no longer, you know, have grave implications, but it is kind of curious that that doctrine 
has not been changed. Exactly. It's definitely not something that by modern standards, um, sh you know, sh makes, you know, it's, it's in any way, shape or form correct or, or, or appropriate. Um, I want to jump into an interesting thing. In passing, we touched on it. We know of numerous instances where rabbis came from England or the US and elsewhere to try to retrieve and rescue Jewish children who had been saved by the church or by nuns or convents or private Christian families during the war. Was there an official church policy relating to the return of these children after the war? And here's something I'm personally very curious about. Throughout your research, have you come across data or estimates of how many such children were lost to the Jewish people? Yeah, for the latter question, no. I mean, I've seen estimates, but they're just so uh, wide ranging from um, you know, a few thousand to many tens of thousands. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, presumably Poland would be the epicenter just because that's where, you know, there were 3.3 .3 million Jews in, in Poland um, yeah. before the war and 90% are murdered. Um, and after the war, you know, very few are left because of those who survived and then go back, they're subjected to pogroms themselves and end up in, um, in Israel or, or elsewhere. So uh, it's thought that there probably were many thousands of Jew Jewish children who survived in Poland, but parents were, were murdered. Um, but also, if you know, France, the Finale case is one of probably a number, um, uh, in, it's believed in Holland and, and other parts of Europe, uh, something similar, because uh, first of all, those who were saved by non-Jewish families were Christian families, and, and a certain proportion of them certainly were Catholic. Plus, as you mentioned, Catholic institutions, um, in some cases nobly and at some risk, uh, took in uh, Jews and Jewish children. So we really don't know. We do know that uh, the Jewish, the organized Jewish community was sufficiently concerned about this, that uh, not only were various uh, international Jewish aid organizations set up specifically for trying to reclaim these Jewish orphans of the war, Jewish orphans of the Holocaust, uh, but the chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi uh, Yitzhak uh, Herzog, uh, traveled through Europe right after 1946 to uh, try to bring attention to this problem. And one of his major um, visits was to the Pope, to Pius XII. And we now do have, well, we already had his uh, record of his conversation with the Pope, but now I've had uh, also these newly available Vatican documents uh, what was going on, how the Pope those around him viewed the rabbi's visit. Uh, so he was he was calling on Pius XII to issue a kind of directive to Catholics worldwide to uh, make known any such Jewish children who were still in, in Catholic hands and, and return them to uh, their Jewish families. Uh, he refused to do that. Uh, and um, yeah, that's part of the story that can now be told with the, the documents. He, they tried to put off the rabbi in the internal documents, say, whatever you do, whatever we do, we shouldn't put anything in writing because it'll be exploited by the Jews. Um, and for Jewish propaganda, the, uh, so, uh, the instructions were because they put off the rabbi until he went back to Jerusalem. They uh, instructed the papal delegate in Jerusalem to only orally tell them not that the Pope was going to put out a statement, but that if you knew of any particular cases, you should bring them to the Vatican's attention and they would you know, do their best to look into them. Wow. It, it comes, to, it just keeps coming back to doctrine, but also the stewards of doctrine in the end, I think. It's not just the doctrine, it's, it's who's in charge and how they execute that doctrine. And in his case, Pope you know, Pius XII, and also in the Edgar Martoro case, where, as you write brilliantly about, the Pope went to such great lengths against mm -hmm. tremendous pressure brought to bear internationally. It, it comes down to those individuals in power and their uh, stubbornness and in a, in a sense, their stubbornness slash humanity or, or I would argue absence thereof. Very, very yeah. heart-wrenching period. I mean, from, certainly from conservative traditionalist point of view in the church, it's not stubbornness, it's sticking up for, you know, sure. uh, the word of God kind of thing. And, uh, you know, Pius IX, the Pope who insisted, as you mentioned, against uh, great political pressure, 
to um, insisted on keeping the Jewish child Edgardo, who was six years old, away from his family, despite the fact, um, you know, in the United States, there were demonstrations of 3,000 people in San Francisco, 2,000 in New York. Right. Uh, the king, uh, the emperor in France got involved in this protesting, insisting that the Pope return the child to, uh, to his family. Uh, so the Pope saw himself as, in fact, uh, it, he said, it's unclear whether this was apocryphal or not, that he said to the boy, um, Edgardo, you are very dear to me. You have cost me my kingdom because subsequent to his death, Edgardo, he in fact would lose the papal states, partly because of the changed position of France and the French emperor, uh, who wasn't happy with what he was doing with uh, this Jewish child. Uh, so, and uh, in the year 2000, uh, to celebrate the uh, millennial uh, year, uh, John Paul II, on the same day, beatified, to step right before becoming saint, uh, two of his predecessors, one, the kind of heroes of the liberals of the church, John the Twenty-Third, who presided over the Second Vatican Council, uh, and it was Pius the Twelfth's successor. But the other was a uh, earlier. He couldn't. He actually was interested in beatifying Pius the Twelfth, apparently, but because of the controversy about his silence during the Holocaust, uh, didn't feel he could, and instead took another Pius, who was a, a hero of the conservatives, namely Pius the Ninth, the one who insisted on keeping Edgardo Mortara from his Jewish family. And the Jewish community of Rome did protest that um, beatification. So let me ask you this. Um, you know, you mentioned a little bit earlier about what brought you into the story personally, your father's connection. But uh, what is, you know, every author has a point to writing a book. Obviously, there's like, you know, in the journalistics, shining a light on an important piece of history. But there's an intended outcome, I imagine. There's an objective. And I wonder whether, in your case, this is about telling the story and maybe even eliciting the acknowledgement and public, uh, even apology. So it brings mm -hmm. me as the church in action and silence about the fate of the Jews and about this, the, the long standing demonization of the Jews. Uh, you did mention the Second Council, which is obviously a major uh, game changer, I would, I, I would imagine. And can you share with us very briefly? some of the progress in this area? Well, I would say, you know, in terms of what I'm trying to do, first of all, um, as a, a scholar, I've been interested in trying, you know, I, I view this history as very important history, um, not just the particular question of church and the Jews, but um, understanding, for example, fascism, understanding the Second World War, understanding um, really two centuries of European and Italian history uh, that too often I think scholars just write in language that only you know, one another reads. And uh, I find this not only important, but also fascinating. And so I've been trying in my, in my books for the last so, 20 years um, to write books with based in the archives with much new to say to scholars, but written in a way that is attractive to a much broader audience. With the specific question, uh, you know, these kind of questions we've been discussing uh, this evening, Yes, I mean, I think, as I mentioned, my book, Popes uh, Against the Jews, about the role of the Vatican in the rise of modern anti-Semitism, really was written as a response to the Vatican's official denial through We Remember that its uh, demonization of the Jews had anything to do with the Holocaust. And similarly, I'm right now, the book I'm working on, uh, which is on Pius XII and his relationships with uh, Mussolini and Hitler during the war, and of course includes the story of his relationship to the uh, and reactions to the uh, ongoing murder of uh, Italy's and, and Europe's mm -hmm. Jews, is uh, being written in part to set the record straight, I guess you could say, about uh, about that history because it's been it's a history that's been denied. But as I mentioned, not just by the Church, it's part of a larger denial of this history. Um, in Italy and uh, in, uh, to an extent in, in France and Austria and other parts of Europe. Hi, Professor, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. I, I apologize. Well, tonight's talk highlighted a darker side uh, of Jewish history. Um, I usually like to conclude our talk on a positive note. And so I'd like to ask you as a final question, can you share beautiful anecdotes or stories of heroism and humanity that you came across in your research and perhaps share as well any Good news or positive? Yeah, I mean, there are various uh, other sides of the story which are much more positive. Um, first of all, I should say that I'm not the only one working this history, and it's not just Jewish uh, scholars who are doing so. 
Um, there's uh, work being done and has been done on this history by uh, a number of important Catholic scholars. I, I showed a picture uh, waiting for the opening day of the archives of Professor Hubert Wolf. Um, he's a priest as well as a, a historian professor of history and his uh, publications are very important ones who that is looking frankly at this history. Uh, there are a number of other Catholic authors like Gary, Gary Wills in the US, um, James Carroll, who've written about this history as well. Uh, so I think you know, it's encouraging that in the church itself, there are, is a movement to come to terms with this history. And it's not just you know, from the Jewish community that we're throwing uh, stones. Uh, you know, I feel I'm working together with various colleagues, many of whom in fact are priests, uh, in trying to come to terms with this history. and. Uh, you know, it's part of a, a larger, it's not just uh, Christians and Jews these days. We talk about uh, religious demonizations of others. Um, it involves, uh, you know, all too many other religious groups as well. So this is a history that I think uh, we're all, all have a stake in, in uh, coming to terms with. We, uh, well, apparently the rabbi's having trouble connecting the, uh, but I do see in the comments, uh, there's a question about whether I think uh, documents might have been removed or destroyed from the archives before they were open. And this is, in fact, a question that many scholars who work there ask as well. And um, it's a little bit hard to answer it. I would say this, that certain kinds of documents are not made available uh, to scholars. Um, so that, for example, uh, what they refer to as personnel documents uh, are not available. And that's why there's never, as far as I know, been any study, for instance, of the sex abuse scandal in the church done based on Vatican archives, because those documents, insofar as they exist, are not made available. Uh, in theory, all uh, other documents uh, should be made available. I've been told that by the, uh, the bishop who uh, directs the, the main Vatican archive. Uh, but there's kind of another Part of the story, Pius XII, if we look at that uh, story, uh, was a very cautious kind of man. And he often would suggest not putting things in writing, uh, which would might be in some way compromising later on. Uh, and so uh, this is kind of a related problem that there may be important discussions that took place that never were, or never uh, had a a record, written record left of them. Wow, Professor, um, the hour is late and I want to wrap up what has been an absolutely fascinating and inspiring conversation. Thank you so much for your time and for your effort and energy. We can't thank you enough for joining us tonight and I want to bless you with continued good health and prosperity and serenity and nachas from your family and from the work that you do.